but here we go. There's a, if you read the newspaper uh, online, obviously, I don't know if anybody still gets those paper things. Uh, read the newspaper, listen to the news. Uh, our, our world is in craziness right now. Uh, there is wars that are threatening to go far beyond the borders that they're in. There's uh, all kinds of chaos. There's uh, addicts that are dry, dying in our streets and in our home. The government doesn't know what to do. The healthcare professionals are struggling with it and to come to an agreement. We're living with high costs. There's financial pressures. Trying to wait, raise godly kids, godly offspring in a world that's gone crazy. And it, it's in times like this that challenge us how to live as followers of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus. Challenging for anybody, but it's also challenging how to live as a follower of Jesus in a world that's really, really crazy. At times, it's probably tempting just to throw up your hands and say, I'm just going to go to church, keep my head down, and forget it, we'll let it all, it, let it go. Abandon it, let it burn. At other, at other times, it's just so overwhelming, there's so much. And we don't know what to do, even if we wanted to do something. And it's in these ever-changing times that we must be governed not by our emotions, not by our political allegiance, not by our fear, not by our apathy, not by our anxiety, not by our anger, not by our judgment, none of those things that might be coming up within us. We must be led by the person and the way of Jesus. He lives differently in a world gone crazy. See, Jesus came into a very dark place in a dark time in history. John 1 and 5 says, this is not a Christmas message, uh, the Christmas message is all year round. John 1 and 5 says, the light, that's Jesus, shines in the darkness. Somebody say shines. shines. It doesn't disappear in the darkness, it shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. And Jesus went on to say a little while later to his disciples in Matthew 16 and 18, and he said this, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, will not overcome it. Darkness doesn't have the last say. Hell does not have the final say. And Jesus continued to say to his disciples in Matthew 5 and 16, in a world that's gone crazy, in a world that's with challenge and dark and all kinds of stuff that we could all list out or things that are out of order, said this, let your light, he says to you and me, let your light, say that's me, we can do better than that, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. There, and then he says as well, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Luke 19 and 13, he says, occupy until I come. There's no hint in Jesus of retreat. There's no hint in Jesus of hide away. There's no hint in Jesus of give up. The church, I will build my church. Hell's not going to prevail. Light's coming. It's not going to be overcome by darkness. Light has come and is coming and is continuing to come. Let your light shine. Occupy till I come. Go into all the world and continue. In other words, the mission of Jesus is unchanging. It's an unchanging mission for an ever-changing world. Our message never changed. Our method may, but our message never changes. That Jesus has come to save and to heal and to deliver and to transform your life, to transform your family, to transform a city, to transform and set people free. That's what Jesus has come to do. I love it when babies say amen. <laughs> See, it's easy. he didn't say if it's easy, make disciples. If it's easy, shine your light. If it's easy, occupy. He said, this is what we do. And as part of the, as a follower of Jesus, as one who... Uh, is part of his great church, his glorious church that he's making, we also don't retreat, we don't shrink back, we lean in. In difficult times, in dark times, in challenging times, even more, we lean in to let our light shine. That's what light does. Light doesn't fight with darkness, it just shines. And darkness moves. We have a vision as a church to be a diverse community of Jesus followers, transforming lives, families, neighborhoods, and nations, that we're not here just to have a holy huddle, 
We're here to be a part of Jesus' great mission for the world. There's a vision that Jesus has of seeing lives transform, of light breaking through, of hope coming, of healing coming, of freedom coming for people. We occupy until He comes. By His grace, we plant life-giving churches until He comes. By His grace, we help the widow and the orphan until He comes. We feed people until He comes. We pray and serve in and through the church until He comes. We make disciples of all nations and people groups and ages and generations until He comes. We show love for the refugee and the, the, the immigrant and the addict until He comes. We don't hide. We don't retreat. We don't take a back seat. We don't run from it. We lean into it with the grace and power and the wind of the Spirit behind us. And we say, Lord, help us to let our light shine. To be part of your unchanging mission in an ever-changing world. And it's greater than any one of us. All of us have a part to play. All of us have an aspect in this mission of Jesus. We all have a bit. Your bit matters. No matter how little or how great, your bit matters. You matter. You have a part to play in the grand story of God where you find your purpose, where you encounter His power as you do, and the world can be transformed, first of all, inside of you, but then through you. Lord, thank you that your word is quick and powerful. I pray that it would divide this morning our thoughts from your thoughts, that you would reveal in our hearts what needs to be revealed, that you would encourage us, strengthen us, convict us, and empower us through the, your word. Let us have ears to hear what your spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. You want to turn in your Bible to Matthew 6, 24 to 34. It's a little bit of a longer passage, uh, but we can do it. I'm reading out the NIV translation. It's going to be on the Sky Bible as well. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and... God and what? Therefore, I tell you, because you can't serve God and money, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and a body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can the flowers of the field, can any of you by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, that was a king, in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, uh, or tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what will he eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? How will we pay the rent? Where am I going to live? What's going to happen? For the people who don't know God, the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first, someone say first, first. His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. But seek first, someone say first. first. One decision, seek first. An order of priority. Have any of you looked back on your life and realized how much your life changed because of one decision? Good or bad. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's negative. The person you married changed everything in your life. Your life changed direction after that. Do you know that if you choose to make the decision to not have extra sugar in your diet, that immediately things will begin to change? I was reading that inflation will grow, chronic inflation, or inflation? Inflammation. That's it. That was, a da that was a Danielism right there. Chronic inflammation will grow, go down. Mental health improves, all kinds of things because of one decision. One, kind, one decision, you take a wrong turn on a freeway. I was talking to someone last night, and they were coming up the connector, and they were going up one way, and there was some, or, and then someone was going up on the other side, going the wrong way. 
somewhere had made a wrong decision in a turn and was suddenly going against traffic and cars dashing out of the way until the person figured out not everybody else is going the wrong way. I think it's me. Made a bad decision, one decision that literally was going to change their life, but they figured it out and got going the right way. But Jesus is speaking to his disciples, his followers, those that would say they belong to him about how to live. He's addressing a very common issue that is still common today. Worry about our money, about our stuff, about our clothes, about our housing, about what our donkey, our camel, our car, our transportation, our kids' school fees, all the things that we concern ourselves about. Worry about whether or not we will have enough reality that wages have not been able to keep up with the inflation of the last four or five years. That, to say nothing of rent that's gone up, mortgage rates that's gone up. Will we be able, it's very funny too, when the, the government says, oh well, the inflation rate is now only 2%. Yeah, but it went like 15, and it's still only 2%. It's still like a lot. Anybody else notice that? Yeah. We worry, will we be able to pay the bills? I hope that I don't miss any work or we're going to be in trouble or I'm going to work overtime and maybe another second job so that we can make it and I wonder if my retirement will be okay. And Jesus starts by reminding us of how precious we are to God before he addresses a deeper issue how precious we are to God. And I want to remind us this morning, like Jesus said, the same God who sees and knows the sparrow knows you and knows you by name and knows what you're going through and knows what the challenge and to settle our heart on that. The same God who knows the number of hairs on the head of every person. They have to keep a running tally with me. Uh, they know every, God knows every detail and worry and challenge that you're facing right now. The same God that creates and cares and creates a flower for beauty for a bee to grow in and feed the beehive and provide for us. The same God who put that all together sees and cares and knows you. As much as he cares for a flower that comes up, is there for a little while and passes away, how much more does he care for you? And Jesus says, yet yeah, you're ever on the run. You're struggling to survive and you just can't make it another month or another day. It's exhausting you. You're running down. It's breaking you down. And in this struggle that you, our hearts go on between loving God and loving money and loving a system of money, Jesus challenges us to do something in response to the running, to the worry, to the stress, to the fear. One thing in this go-go world. And he says this in Matthew 6, 33. But seek first, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things that we're worrying about will be given to us as well. If we try to get the things, we will never get them. But if we go after the one thing, he takes care of us. You want to, we can take, try and take care of ourselves. Or we can go after the first thing. And let him take care of us. And so this month we're going to dive into another countercultural formation principle. We talked in September about living no lies, about how to not be conformed by the world, the flesh, and the devil around us. That we need to do different practices to be a different person. And we talked last month about community. And now we're going to talk this month about another spiritual principle, a spiritual practice. That generosity is another spiritually counterculture practice that shapes us to be more like Jesus. Katie talked about it just briefly there where she said, in this times like this, our tendency is to want to hold more. To keep more security for ourselves. Because I don't know if I and our heart can get a little hard and our hand grip on everything can get a little tighter. But generosity causes us to open our hands to receive from the Lord and also from those same hands give to others, reflecting the reality that everything we have comes from Him and everything that we are is through Him by our good Jesus. So today we're going to talk about, and over these next few weeks, how to put money in its place. Because money is a great servant, but a terrible master. 
Today we're going to talk about how to lower our worry, reduce our stress around finances, experience greater peace by putting God first in our financial lives through the principle of tithing. Bubba. I actually like talking about money. Jesus did a lot. See, the Hebrew word that is translated as tithe is not really complicated. It literally means a tenth or 10%. Tithing is returning. Everyone say returning. returning. Tithing is returning the first 10% of our income to God's church. Leviticus 27 and 30 says this, a tithe, everyone say a tithe. a tithe. A tithe of everything from the land, whether from the grain, from the soil, or the fruit from the tree belongs to the Lord. It is holy to God. The word holy means it's set apart. It's designated for another purpose. It's to be returned to God. It belongs to Him. Secondly, tithing is returning to God my first and best so that He can bless all the rest. He can do more with a blessed 90% than I can doing it all my own with all my 100%. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Some of you like the last phrase there. It doesn't just tell us to honor God with our spiritual gifts, with our talents, our time, or with our worship. We're supposed to do that, but it also tells us, honor God with our what? Honor the Lord with your... Oh, it's right there, right? <laughs> Honor the Lord with your wealth. Okay, yes. I was like, is everybody reading the same translation as me? Honor the Lord with your wealth. There we go. So whatever wealth is, the first fruits of our increase, and we worship Him with the tithe. You can worship the Lord. That's why we do uh, take our tithes and offering as part of our worship, because it is an act of worship to return the tithes to the Lord. And then the Bible says, your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. We're going to talk more about the blessing but in a few moments. But let's just ask the question, why should we do this? I mean, besides the fact that if we're a follower of Jesus, we obey him. But why should we do it? There are many, many reasons. But let's look at just three and then we'll be done. Tithing provides for God's work through the church. Just that clearly. It, uh, there are all kinds of things that happen through the church where we... Every week we pack hampers that go to 25 families that on a weekend wouldn't eat or would have very little food if we didn't give them that food. Every week. Every week. And then we use our facility here. Uh, city Dream Center comes and packs hampers for 250 people that all over the city are 250 families, I should say, that get, receive food because of using our facility. All kinds of things like that. There's youth ministry that happens. There's pillars ministry that happens. There's young adult ministry that happens. There, there's stuff overseas that happens. There's churches that get planted. All because we do what God has called us through the church. God loves the church. I love the church. We should all love the church. I believe that Jesus through the church is the hope for the world. And this is what it says in Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe. Not a part of it, but bring all of it, all 10%, into the storehouse. And you can do your research, but most conservative theologians through generations have said that the Old Testament or the New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament storehouse is the local church. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That there might be what? Food in my house. That means the resources. In other words, when you tithe... To, the, the, to God through the local church. The church moves forward. It provides for God's work in and through. So I want to tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that yes, the, the tithe helps provide for the work of God in and through the local church. So why do we tithe? Because it helps fund the work of God through His church. I've shared this before, but this is like a little uh, breather moment for some of you that are ready to pass out. Uh, two men crashed in their private plane on a South Pacific island and they... They, they survived and they're standing there and the first guy ran off and he looked all around the island and realized there was no food. The one island in the South Pacific that had no fruit on it, that's the one they landed on. No water, there was nobody around. He comes running back, he says, there's no food, there's no people, there's no water, we are going to die. The guy says, no we're not, I make $250,000 a week. The guy said, did you hear me? There is no food, no people, and no water, we are going to die. I make $250,000 a week. I'm not going to die. 
says, are you nuts? There's no food, no water, no people. We are going to die a slow and painful death. He said, no, no, no. I make $250,000 a week. I'm a Christian. I tithe. I go to Horizon Church, and Pastor Craig will find me. <laughs> There's your moment. Everybody breathed. So the second reason why we tithe is so that you can be found. No, I'm just kidding. It hits us more personally. It teaches me to put God first in my life. Deuteronomy 14 and 23. The purpose of the tithe is to teach you always to put God first in your life. Hmm. We don't naturally like to put others first. Isn't that true? If you have little children, you just find that as soon as someone else has something, they want it. If you ever go with your spouse to McDonald's and you're like, hey, I'm going to get some fries. Do you want any? No, I'm fine. Sure, because I can get you another one. I really, I really, you're sure. Yeah, they don't want them. Then you buy them and they say, can I have a few? No. Early in our marriage, yeah. Now, no, you had your chance. I'm just kidding. Well, maybe, not really. <laughs> you had your chance. Because we don't, we're naturally, especially us guys with our fries, we don't like to share. Is that true, man? If you're getting the fries, I don't want to share. So, plus, anyway, there's more things I could say about that, but I won't. And, and in the New Testament, Jesus goes after this principle of first, God first in our life and finances a little bit more, where he says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also, in Matthew 6 and 21. Wherever you put your treasure, your time, your talent, your heart's drawn there. Tell you what, when you, if you ever have a boat in the summer, you know where your heart's drawn? To the lake, to the ocean, to get into your sailboat and go. You want to go. That's why you got the boat. You've invested money into it. You got to use it. If you're Whatever it might be, if I was going to say the gym membership, but we invest money in that all the time. Our heart is there, but our body isn't. That's true, isn't it? My heart, I'm going to... No, my body says no. So, But if I put my money in a boat, that's where my affection goes. If I put my money in clothes, that's where, I, where my affection goes. If I invest my time into a, a street ministry, that's where my, my affection goes. My heart follows where I put my investment. We don't wait to follow our heart. We actually can lead our heart. Follow your heart is the dumbest thing that someone could say. Because our heart without God is deceitful. It will tell us all kinds of things that are not accurate. So we lead our heart in the direction it needs to go. It links to our heart. Because when our heart is surrendered to God, He can begin to address the fear, the worry, the anxiety, the thing that you're facing, and speak to you. And giving a portion of our life by returning of our tithe in this context is a guaranteed way to give God access to your heart. Because where your treasure is, there your what will be? Your heart will be. And all the life change that you desire starts in here, in your heart. And if God says, I, I want, or if you said, God, I want you to be number one in my life. Uh, I want your priorities to be my priorities. But he has no place or the last place in your finances. That's a contradiction. Not accurate. There are few, if any, more tangible ways to measure if God is first in your finances than returning the tithe. Now, some of you might answer, argue, yeah, great, but that's Old Testament stuff. We're not under the law. We're under grace. Okay. Well, we need to understand that, first of all, that the tithe predated the law. It existed before the law by several hundred years. And Jesus not, but Jesus in the New Testament not only mentioned the tithe, he only also clearly affirmed that it should happen. He was giving the Pharisees, the religious leaders, a good going over as he was wont to do, and he was criticizing them, and he says, you're very careful to tithe even the tithest, tiniest income from your herb garden. Ten, one, two, three, four, five, one for God, nine for me. Doing all that, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. And that's why many are, can get turned off of church. Because, not because we talk about finances, but because we can neglect other more important things 
It's not either or, it's both and. And Jesus essentially says, you should tithe. Yes, you should tithe. That's what we do. This has been around since before the law, but then don't neglect the more important things. Don't forget the offerings. Don't forget the justice, uh, biblical justice for the oppressed. Don't forget the mercy for the sinner. Don't forget the widow. Don't forget the orphan. Don't forget the refugee. Don't forget the prisoner. Don't forget the addict. Don't forget your children. Don't forget your wife. Don't forget your marriage. All those things. It's not either or, but it's a key to putting God first in our finances. The tithe provides for the work of God through the church and it teaches me to put God first. And finally, tithing builds my faith in God. If we sat down and had a coffee and you said, I'm having a really hard time trusting God with my life. Really hard time. I have all kinds of stuff. I don't know if he's going to do what he said he would do. I don't know if he's going to come through. And a fair question as part of our discussion might be, do you tithe? What? How, what do you mean? Because chances are you're going to say no because the reality is that tithing is one of the key ways to build your faith in God. Because in no other way, no, probably no more tangible way can you say I trust God than this. Malachi 3 and 10 says this when it comes to tithing. Test me in this, God says. Test me. Try me. Dare you. Give it a shot. Test me. And see if I will not throw open the windows or the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. We want the blessing that there will not be enough room for it. And the key that unlocks that is tithing. You don't believe me? God says, try it. Give me a shot. See if I won't prove myself faithful. And hey, here's the thing. Don't you dare say that you heard me say, put something in it, pull a lever, and ding, 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 ding. Whoa! Look what happened! So much money everywhere, in the mail, thousands of dollars, it appears, gold everywhere. I'm not saying that. It'd be a little ridiculous sometimes to make a point. Oh, and then some of you are thinking, no, you're mostly ridiculous. <laughs> God has some blessings that are way greater than money, though. Come on. Yeah. Like a healthy and strong marriage together. Children that are faithfully serving God. Friendships with people that love you. Ministry opportunities that you get to serve. A peaceful, at-rest heart. But I don't also want to discount the fact that the reality is one of the blessings of God is also financially. And God may also just bless you financially as you are faithful to give. To return the tithe and give generously of offerings. So, Jen Wendell Morse in our church, uh, she shared this testimony with me a few years ago. And so I just want to read, I asked her, because I think sometimes we think this is not for real people. But 10 years ago, this November, Jen's once enjoyable job had become unbearable. She was not being compensated properly for her efforts, singled out and experiencing conflict and stress was so intense that one day she feared she was going to have a heart attack. Her blood pressure was in the stroke category. Super challenging. Then suddenly the company was sold, and over the Christmas holiday, she didn't receive a paycheck. There was major conflict. It was then she realized, time to look for a new opportunity. So she attended several interviews and came across a reception uh, opportunity with her current employer. Though it was far below her ability, she saw it as a way to get her foot into the door. Within a week, she had two interviews and a job offer. Although the salary was slightly lower than what she had been earning, she felt a strong prompting from the Lord to tithe. She already was tithing, but to tithe differently. To tithe based on what she aspired to earn one day, rather than her current salary. This act of obedience that God asked her to do isn't a formula unless God tells you to do it, but a testament to her faith that God impressed on her heart for that season. She still ties, but no longer to her desired earnings, having not received any guidance from God like that. But God continues to faithfully provide for her and open doors of advancement within that organization. Now, 10 years later, her annual salary has doubled, and she anticipates further changes to her role in compensation by the end of this year. For her, she says this, Tithing is about obedience. I trust that God will supply all my needs according to His riches and glory. This faith leads me to believe that God's favor resulting from my obedience provides me with opportunities and He meets my financial needs. End of story. So here's the thing. It takes trust to put God first at the front. Not after everything's taken care of. Oh, there's a little bit left over. Or there's nothing left over. But to put Him first. 
by returning the tithe. When I take that step of faith, I'm saying, God, I need you in my life. I need you to help me. Everything is in me screaming, hold back, grip holder, tighten up. But your word tells me to return the tithe first. For me to do that, I'd have to stop buying some things I really want. Yep. For me to do that, I'd have to reprioritize my entire life and center it around God. Yep. I think that's the point. And your life will be forever changed and at this point because it's about the heart. Tithing is a tangible way of saying, God, I will put you first. I will give you my first and my best and I will trust you to bless the rest. My heart can rest because God is just that good. See, tithers know this because they have experienced it. How many times, miraculously, with the presence of and the help of God, they have seen how that 90% with the blessing of God goes way further than 100% without the blessing of God on it. And if you're a tither, you know that, you've experienced it, there's no going back. This is something that I've practiced all my life. It wasn't an option when we got into, into our marriage. There was times where I was like, oh, but God has been faithful and is faithful and will be faithful to do what he said he would do. And as we can realize that why we tithe, it provides for the work of God, teaches me to put God first, it builds my faith. An unchanging mission for an ever-changing world. And as we're praying today in a moment, there are those of you who are Christ followers, some of you are tithers and some are not tithers. I want to speak to both of you. Don't raise your hand yet, but say, do you want to tithe? Or do you want to continue to tithe? I invite you to stand real quick. Because I'm really believing that right now some are tithing, which is fantastic, and, and you know what it means to be a tither. Some of you maybe used to tithe and realize I've been convicted by God even this morning. I've got to get back to putting God first in my finances. And some of you have never tithed in your life. You've given emotionally here and there once in a while. But this is a different level. This is about taking a step of faith and choosing to put God first and trust Him. And if you're already a tither or you know, just close your eyes for a moment because I want, this is the question I want to ask and I want to re, you to respond between you and the Lord but something about doing a physical act to say, Lord, this is what I want. So just bow your head, close your eyes for a moment. Some of you are tithing. Some are being convicted by God to get back at it. Some to do it for the very first time. But if you would say, I want, I want to put him first this way. I want to give you a chance to lift your hands. That's me. I want to put God first this way. Just throw up your hand. Or I want to continue to put God first this way. God, I thank you for those that all the hands all over the room. Lord, that you would help each one. Thank you that as we put you first in this way, you deal with our heart, you shift us, you change, you enter our life in a different way because we have chosen to put you first. And so Lord, I thank you that you are the one who supplies. You are the one who makes a way. You are the one who uh, gives us the power to get wealth. You are the one who watches over us better than any bird that flies through the air. You clothe us better than any flower. You take care of your sons and your daughters through this putting principle of putting you first. Secondly, if you're here and you've never put, made Jesus the forgiver and leader of your life and put him at the first place, you'd say, we're talking, you're talking about all this other stuff about money, but you recognize there's a higher principle that you've, maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. And if you would like to surrender your life to Jesus, I want to pray with you. Just every, every head bowed and every eye closed. Just pop up your hand for a moment and I want to pray with you. You're saying, I want to put God first. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Yes. It's as simple as ABC. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. We talked about it during communion today. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. God, I need help. Forgive my sin. I believe that Jesus is the way that he forgives my sin. He died, buried, and rose again so that I could be made right with God. 
And finally, it's just confess, Lord, come in and be the forgiver and leader of my life. Be the Lord of my life. So you want to pray with me, those of you that raised your hand this right now, just quietly to yourself, something along the lines of, Lord, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I believe that you made a way through the sacrifice of your son to reconcile me to God, to forgive my sins. So I confess that you are the Lord of my life. I need you. Come in and begin the process of leading my life into all that it's ever been meant to be. Thank you that you are the one who can break me free from the power of my past. You're the one who can create in me a clean heart. You're the one who can open the way into a brand new life, a journey that begins with a first step of putting God first and say, lead my life. If you prayed that prayer, I invite you to tell someone that you came with today or come and talk to me or one of somebody that has a lanyard on and just let them know we can help you further. Let's put God first.